Welcome to The Young and the Restless. I'm Zach. I'm Olivia. And I'm Victor. And this is the podcast where some idiot fell down his own stairs. Now I let me down to sleep. I dreamt I had a soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, will that dream just go on for its own sake? No tengo dinero. Yo soy soltero. Victor fell down the stairs. Yes, I did. Oh no. Were you holding on to that until we started recording? No, I just saw I'm I'm sitting on the floor behind Victor right now because uh I can't sit. Lumbar support. Yeah. yeah. But there's a big bruise on the back of your arm. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, that one surprised me. I just like felt it and was like, ow. Oh. Oh, that's right. After all that worrying about you going up and down the stairs. Yeah, yeah, no, we were just talking about that, weren't we? Yeah, I was just saying I don't think we should be bringing the baby up and down the stairs all the time. Uh, we've lived in our house for like two and a half years and... You forgot about uh, the main baby. <laughs> <laughs> what about this baby? <laughs> they're like wooden stairs and they're not like sketchy necessarily, but like they're hard stairs. <laughs> and uh, he was wearing socks and I was in the kitchen and I heard... I heard him fall and like turned and he was falling for like a good five to seven seconds <laughs> yep. after I, after the initial kathunk. Just kept going. Cause I like, I like was walking on my big floppy socks, not a care <laughs> in the world. Dogs trotting behind me. I'm wise cracking at Olivia about something and my feet go out from under me. And then I like fall and I'm kind of like half on my ass and half on my side. And I just like thunk down every stair, and then I kick through a baby gate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the baby, the baby gate, gate, goes gate went flying. flying. <laughs> and I just land on my ass, um, and so I'm all bruised up. Those are the worst one. The ones that last like multiple seconds. No, the dogs are have been like really worried about him going up and down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, now that like before our our dumber dog was like whatever and would just like try and like knock me over running down the stairs and now he's looking at me like I don't know, man. <laughs> he like waits. He waits Be at careful. the top. He waits for you to get all the way off the stairs. <laughs> yeah, those floppy socks will do it too against the the wood. Mhm. Otherwise, you know, they have pretty good traction, but yeah, they suck to fall down. We had uh wooden stairs to our basement growing up and uh like just wood like splintery hard wood hmm. and it was one of those ones that goes down to a platform and then makes a turn and goes down more you know what i mean yeah and uh for some reason I, I don't remember where my parents were or my sister but i had the house to myself for one week in high school and so naturally i was walking around naked and <laughs> my room was in the basement and i remember running down the stairs naked <laughs> And I had never done that before, and I, so I didn't know what it would look like. <laughs> and like seeing, you know, everything down there, like jostling with the stair, I laughed so hard immediately at my <laughs> at my own anatomy, like flapping around like that, and uh, <laughs> like missed a step and went tumbling, like like ass over short, like what is the expression, ass over teacup or whatever. <laughs> I thought you meant like you didn't know what it would look like. Like figuratively, like you didn't know what that that experience would be like going down the stairs naked. Not that you literally didn't know what it would what it would look like. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'd never run downstairs naked before. That's not a, that's not a thing you get to do in life very often. Yeah, and I guess you're looking at your feet, like at the stairs. So I was trying to look at my feet. I got distracted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there were three components, and they were not moving together in unison. It was like a bag of groceries being jostled in a car. And it was, <laughs> it was so funny that I just ate shit. And so I fell naked down wooden stairs. Oh, man. Like hit that platform and then like rolled down the next few. And I was still laughing. I was like laid out flat on the concrete <laughs> naked, still laughing at myself. <laughs> and that's why people have those cameras in their home for some moment. <laughs> moments like that. I wish that had been captured. One time we had like a babysitter who brought who would bring her own baby to babysit us and um 
her baby started going down our stairs and she dove after her baby obviously and slid all the way down the flight of stairs and put a huge hole in the wall at our house <laughs> so but the baby was okay the baby was fine yeah okay worth it then that's why my sister broke her collarbone when we were kids doing the classic like trying to ride a box like a sled down the stairs broke her collarbone like you need a bigger box yeah we always went in sleeping bags Actually, it might have been sleep. I don't know. I don't remember if it was sleeping bags or a box or an actual sled, but whatever it was, it didn't work. I remember doing a lot of kinds, those kinds of things as a kid, trying to see, like make a blanket work as a parachute. Mm-hmm. Did you ever pull that move? Not the same technology. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that a, an umbrella would work. Like in Mary Poppins. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't like a. I wasn't like a bold kid when it came to stuff like that like i didn't know i didn't want to like yeah i know it's almost <laughs> like the personality i have now is connected to the personality i had back then but uh <laughs> um yeah i was like i i don't know i still like climbing trees not really something i'm into you're I, not a height other guy. kids do it but not for me it's weird i was a little of you are heights guys not now i was a little psycho as a kid I can see that. I don't know what happened. The anxiety, I guess. An existential mm. crisis. Yeah, I can't remember if I was talking about it on the pod or just like with Shelby, but I had like really bad anxiety in second grade and before like kindergarten through second grade, like a uh, Zena thing, <laughs> reaching a, a pinnacle in second grade. Where I missed like most of the year because I was going home sick every day because I didn't know what a panic attack was. So mm. I didn't have the language for it. So I'll just be like, oh, I don't feel good. And they put me in like, you know, sent me to the guidance counselor to get like therapy or whatever. It just went away until I was like 22 and then it came back. So yeah, in those like middle years, <laughs> I was a little, you know, I, probably like a normal-ish little boy doing, hanging off bridges and doing stupid shit. That's, so it just like, it went away in second grade, just kind of out of nowhere. Did any, did anything like help or? I don't know. I, I, I assume it, it had to have been chemical. Huh. Like the, the chemicals balanced out for a little bit. I remember I really liked my third grade teacher. I think she probably helped, like did a good job, like creating a comfortable environment for me. Miss Moholland, shout out. It's funny to picture like that that would, that would be you with that anxiety is you'd just be like doing crazy. You'd be running around and jumping off bridges and doing like still at weird th- tricks and shit. At 33 years old. Just yeah. Still. <laughs> Who wants to play I've King met- of the Hill? <laughs> absolutely met those guys though <laughs> yeah. uh, I used to have bottle rocket fights with my cousins we like launch fireworks at each other yeah, that's a classic See, I was never fun <laughs> not once <laughs> never been fun never gonna be fun not I'm with that attitude with that. I don't know maybe, maybe the kid will bring out some fun side in me but probably not <laughs> <laughs> not, not that kind of fun <laughs> not there the, you get not... down from there not the injurious fun. I think you're fun. You're more fun than anyone else I know. You're biased. Yeah. I am. But I like him better than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Just like me because I'm quippy. I do, <laughs> yeah, I do that's quips. Fun. That's fun. That's fun. <laughs> There's going to be a period of time where uh, our kid thinks we're so funny. And then there's going to be a period of time where our kid thinks we're the least funny people in the world. Yeah, it's going to fall off hard. I'm hoping that they come back around. I keep warning Olivia to expect our kid to really, really hate our guts for like a significant period of time. Yeah, probably after, you know, yeah, probably. Well, like 14 yeah. to yeah. 18. Like, I'm just hoping that I'll have, like, I'll have won them over by 30, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's my goal. I think my dad's funny now again. Good. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's my that's my goal. A couple years ago, I heard a joke that reminded me of my dad because it was you know a, a, a dad joke, and I texted it to him, and he immediately shot back like w- within a minute. He texted back, "Due to the quarantine, I will only be accepting inside jokes." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Oh snap! Don't try to out He's... dad joke the dad." <laughs> <laughs> He'd been waiting for that. I know. <laughs> been sitting on that one. I 
I had kind of a cute dream last night. Oh yeah. I, I did. I you woke me up telling me that dream. I was asleep. Yeah. And you were like, funny. I had a dream. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. Okay. So I know there was some of this dream that I don't remember. I remember the end of the dream. But like me and Olivia had somehow like adopted or sheltered a Sasquatch <laughs> that was living out in the yard. <laughs> and I, I don't really remember a shelter, but there was definitely like a place that the Sasquatch was living. And I remember we had like been like farming. We'd been like planting fruits and veggies and growing stuff to feed the Sasquatch. And we had it like sitting out there by the Sasquatch. And then the next thing I know, um, the Sasquatch has like cut down most of a tree. And I remember they were like long strips, like it was like it was like a cut down tree, but in in my dream it was like long flat boards, like <laughs> like an or like long like straight pipes of tree or whatever. Um, and I remember that they were eating the bark off of the tree. That's what they wanted off of the off of the wood was to eat the bark. And then like Olivia was like, "Oh no, they didn't." I think it was, I think it was a she. I'll just say she. It'll be easier. Olivia was like, "Oh, she didn't like like the the f- food that we made for her or whatever." And uh I was like, "No, no, it's fine. We got to go talk to her." And <laughs> we we went out there and I remember explaining to the Sasquatch that like cutting like we the tree was gone now we couldn't keep using the tree like that wasn't sustainable but that like she needed to eat like the stuff we were growing for her and that was gonna be sustainable and she got it and she's like oh okay (laughs) (laughs) and uh then i remember me and olivia had like created like a makeshift like shaving razor blade and it was like just like attached to a wall. I remember we had like cut some little notches in it or something that made it like suitable for shaving. But it was like stuck to the wall. So I guess the idea is the Sasquatch was just gonna go up to it and like kind of rub their cheek against a blade <laughs> and it would like clean shave them. <laughs> uh and then the last thing that happened is I remember trying to make it clear to the Sasquatch that they had to put like this little rubber guard on it <laughs> on the shaving blade when they weren't using it otherwise it's just like a a big razor bl- like a s- big straight razor just like hanging on the side of a wall and I was like that's really dangerous you gotta make sure to cover that up when you're not using it or you might hurt yourself and that was it I woke up <laughs> and I remember it was very cute the whole thing was very cute and felt very cute when I was in it and when I woke up I was like that was so cute and hey. so I told Olivia about it <laughs> This, like it was a it was a cute squatch, very cute squatch. Yeah, this feels like a, I mean, this is, feels so obviously like a parenting dream to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, have you already looked up Bigfoot? No, mm-hmm. is it like about mysteries, mysteriousness? I mean, kind of. You could take okay. it that way. Um, well, I mean, you said Sasquatch, but it just redirects to Bigfoot. To dream of Bigfoot represents shock or surprise that you are seeing something. You may be in disbelief that someone elusive has appeared in your life. It may also reflect situations or news that takes you by complete surprise. You are metaphorically pinching yourself or having trouble accepting something amazing that has happened. Mm. So you, you could you could interpret that to be about parenthood if you're if you're having feelings of like, holy shit, I'm gonna be a dad. That's amazing. Yeah. Also, just like again, it's so weird for it to be like this thing that's gonna fundamentally change everything. Everything is about to happen. So it's like kind of hard to believe. It could also be about that actual Bigfoot that Victor saw the other day. Mm, could be, yeah. yeah. I mean, the teaching your kid to shave is like a classic dad <laughs> yeah, move, <sure>. you know? <laughs> yeah, so the kid is the Bigfoot. It's funny, you were talking about it's, its diet. I was just listening to a podcast earlier where they were debating whether or not Bigfoot's a carnivore. Oh, really? This Bigfoot was not a carnivore. This wait, so she was eating tree bark? Yes. Slabs of tree. You made it was sound like Was she eating the wood or just the bark? I think just the bark. I remember it was like the wood looked like clean and kind of manufactured, like you'd use in construction. And it was like she was 
like very carefully precise like like cutting the wood but then it was to get the bark off and eat the bark Hmm. i don't know why it's important to me that it was like really clean looking wood but it wasn't like a pile of branches it was like yeah it was like something you'd build something with which we're currently we have like a little bit of a construction project happening at our house yeah was it a oak tree I don't know what kind or of tree. I don't know trees. He doesn't know trees. Oh, man. Dream Bible has oak tree, willow tree, acacia tree, apple tree, bonsai. I taught him the difference between cedars and pine trees. Bonsai. Please, do you remember? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Cedar, evergreen, cherry blossom, Christmas, coconut tree. There's so many trees. Elm tree. Did you only see the tree once it was cut down? Yeah, I like had an awareness that there was a tree there, but I only really paid attention to it when it was like reduced to wood. Yeah, I guess you could look do stump, right? Orange tree, palm tree, pear tree, pine tree, tree fort, tree of life, tree trunk, tree. Hat. Well, now now we're drifting away. I'm just like baffled by the people are just like significantly dreaming about the different types of trees. Let's see, and the tree, uh, so trees. To dream of a tree represents an area of your life that is well-established or deeply rooted. A situation or problem that is immovable or unchangeable, something that requires significant effort to alter or remove. Feelings of an established area of your life or roots with people that can always be relied on, your confidence, faith, or reliance on something. Feelings about protection from parents or family life. A tree can also symbolize a well-established area of your life that has become very comfortable or that you think will never change. And then there's Mm -hmm. stuff about um, to dream of a tree trunk. I guess it was like kind of reduced to a trunk. There's like still some tree, but it was like, or a tree stump, I guess. Yeah, there's a stump entry and a dead tree entry. Um, So it was like enough of... this tree had been cut away that I knew the tree was not going to be able to grow back. And that was a concern for me. I was trying to tell the Sasquatch, like, you can't do that. But it wasn't... You need to eat this vegetable, these vegetables instead. But it wasn't chopped down, was it? I mean, no. It kind of looked chopped down. Like, I don't think the Sasquatch had, like, a saw or an axe or whatever, but, like, it was effectively chopped down. Does that make sense? Yeah. That. So it would be kind of like a dead tree. Well, it's interesting that the tree entry is all about like sturdiness and like security and that like things that um you can rely on won't change without significant effort. And then this in the in your dream, like that happened. Yeah. Yeah. It uh it says here a dead tree represents a change to a stable or well established situation. Either your confidence has been lost or a difficult problem was solved, feelings about total loss or that some well-established aspect of your life is lost, feelings about a loss of confidence or that your life is ruined, (laughs) feelings about a thriving part of your life being lost, and then to dream of a tree stump represents feelings about a significant change or a loss in your life regarding something established that you are learning to live without, the end of a phase a loss of stability, or the remnants of past experiences that are still rooted in your life. That all really feels like a dream about becoming a parent, yeah, like yeah, I mean, it, entering parenthood. Yeah. Yeah, it tracks with the, if, if the Bigfoot is, you know, the kid. Or Yeah, then the Bigfoot is the one that did that to the tree. Yeah, yeah like a, well, a deeply rooted, well-established way of life. Yeah, and trying, and you were like, trying stop, to feed on this that. This is not sustainable. <laughs> we grew all this fruit for you over here. <laughs> yeah, seems like you're running like a simulation of what it's gonna be like and how to like, I don't know, um, prepare for it. I guess like, yeah, yeah, like um, if the tree represents like things I care about that I'm worried will be disrupted. And the vegetables maybe represent, like, you know, things that me and Olivia are prepared to give, mm-hmm. you know, and ready to give. And maybe I'm feeling, like, a tension between, like, or, like, a concern of, like, well, I know what I'm, what I'm willing to sacrifice and what I'm willing to do. But, like, I have an anxiety about the things I'm not willing to give up that maybe are going to get devoured anyway or whatever. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you hear a lot about like parenthood and like I guess I hear this a lot about childbirth right now, but like also parenthood it's, is something that is so wildly out of your control. <laughs> like you cannot control everything about it. You can be prepared for various situations, but you cannot control how they're going to go. Like you can you can influence them. You can have like you can make choices, but like there are just going to be things that come up that are like you you weren't prepared for that you you couldn't have done anything about, you know. <clears throat> the food that you had that was supposed to be for the Bigfoot, would you say that was you were farming it? You could say that. Sure. Cuz that Thank you, that is what you said. That entry yeah. is all about for farm is all about exactly what you would think it <laughs> would be about about preparing and uh, developing, being very focused on maximizing outcomes or end results. And then down here it says farm symbolism may be common to people raising children, mm. <laughs> teaching people, or trying to develop a success- successful business. But it sounds like overall it was like a positive dream. Like you, oh, it was adorable. you felt positively about the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. I felt positive about the whole thing and I thought it was a cute dream. I love that our, our baby was a Sasquatch. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I wonder what it means if, if you dream about your baby being other cryptids. Yeah. Like if you had a chupacabra baby. Right. A, ch- a chipper crap cobra baby. A chipper crap cobra <laughs> baby. But Victor, you like, you especially like Bigfoot, right? Like you kind of have like an affinity for Bigfoot. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> I don't know. Don't you? No, maybe I'm wrong. I feel like you talk about Bigfoot a lot. Okay, so we've been talking about... (laughs) (laughs) Olivia, all men talk about Bigfoot a lot. Is this the the Roman Empire Yeah, exactly, (laughs) yeah. So the last, like, day or whatever, Olivia was... Yesterday, Olivia was like, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? I saw this tweet. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. right. It's like a thing going around. And I was like, you know, not that much. Every now and then it comes up. It's, like, relevant sometimes, but pops in my head, Um, which is not as much as it sounds like it is for some people. And then today, Olivia was like, I read the girl equivalent is Helen Keller. Women are always thinking about Helen Keller. Which I I do think about Helen Keller probably like maybe like once every other week. (laughs) That is a lot. It's more than I (laughs) think. It feels like a lot. Right. (laughs) And I was like, I don't think about Helen Keller that much. And I don't know that I think about the Roman Empire that much. I I thought maybe Bigfoot is my thing. (laughs) When I saw that tweet about the Roman Empire and, and men thinking about it all the time. The first thing that jumped to my mind was I, I thought that was World War II. Sure. I thought we were sure. all thinking about World War II. Everyone think about World War II. What? I feel like everyone thinks about World War II. Yeah. Yeah. I think about it a lot. That's like one, like there's like a handful of interests you're allowed to have like when you're getting into your 30s, like at least there used to be. And like World War II was like a big thing for a certain set of guys. Go deep into the World War II historical, like learning about the battles and everything. Yeah, well, I was one of those nerds that was into it in, like, eighth grade. Sure, I, yeah. I really liked history class. No, I think it's, like, I definitely, like, had a, like, phase when I was in, like, when I was, like, a teenager where I was, like, real interested in, like, uh, like ancient, like, war stuff, like, ancient battles and empires and everything, and, like, that kind of goes up through World War II, and it feels like World War II's ending is, like, now you're in the modern era, and then it's like, okay, this is all just a bunch of bullshit that makes me depressed from kind yeah, of that point. Yeah, I was gonna say, the wars get very sad after that. Yeah, Not the- World War II uh, was great. <laughs> 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 no one's got anything bad to say about World War II. No. World War One, more like World War Fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know why it was like something about when you got into Vietnam, it felt real. Maybe, maybe because <laughs> those were our grandparents. Yeah, I think that's mm-hmm. kind of the difference is mm-hmm. like knowing people that were that were in it. Like I, I like my my like World War Two connection is like my grandmother's dad died in World War Two, and that had like a big effect on her because like well she grew up without a dad, right? But like it's that abstract. It's like my grandparent lost a lost a parent, right? It's like pretty far removed. Versus like you can have an uncle that fought in Vietnam. Yeah, and even like culturally, like I grew up listening to music that would have been made when Vietnam was happening. Right. Whereas right. like culturally, I don't even know what was happening in America in the forties. Like I don't know what what songs were charting, what movies were in the theaters. Like I 
have no finger on the pulse of 1940. What? The Great Depression? Yeah, I think the main thing happening during World War II was uh, World, World War, War II. II. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty big deal. Yeah. You think people back then were like, oh my God, I'm so sick of hearing about World War II. <laughs> it's all anyone talks about at the grocery store. Probably a little bit. That's what I felt during the pandemic. Sure. Like, uh, <laughs> I remember going to, uh, I think it was the grocery store, and like, the clerk said something to me about it being the apocalypse, and I was like, God, I hope it is, because I'm so sick of hearing about it. <laughs> like, if the world's going to end, would it just do it already? This is the slowest, most <laughs> painstaking apocalypse. There's this song that uh, I used to like to open my sets with, um, but I've had to stop playing it, or I have stopped playing it. <gasps> Because That's a good like song. yeah, it's yeah, it's a it's a strong way to start a set. But uh, like in the first couple of lines, I say something about like a looming pandemic. I specifically I say something about <laughs> like about like medicine, like modern medicine causing a pandemic. <laughs> Did you write this before the pandemic? Yes, long before, long before years it. before. Yeah. And so now I can't play the fucking song. <laughs> you feel like it comes across as like anti-vax? Is that why? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it it feels like if you're hearing it in passing, it sounds like an anti-vax, like, like conspiracy theory thing. Oh, that sucks. You when could, I, you could, that's kind of a good like thing for conversation between songs, though. You can, you can really yeah. s- start off by telling that story. <laughs> yeah. You can't start a set that way, no, though. You can't go and be like, <laughs> no, you can't start. I'm Victor Simpson. Way. Before I get started, I wrote this like, song. I know this sounds like an anti-vax song, but <laughs> hear me out. No, it was about. <laughs> I was trying to talk about uh, the thing with like how antibiotics, like uh, we yeah. like overuse them, and like it's it makes it more likely that we create diseases that can't be fought by antibiotics, and it's going to be a huge fucking problem. I was trying to write about that, or is like I had like a couplet that was about that as like an example of whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, but doesn't sound like that in the modern <laughs> context. I think we can all agree that the greatest loss over the last couple of years of this global pandemic is that Victor can't play that song anymore. It's true. Yeah. I mean, do you go on to is is that is that just setting up the idea for like something else metaphorically in this song? You know what I mean? Yeah, but people aren't listening. <laughs> but you could change yeah. a couple lyrics, right? If you don't have to change the rest of them. Exactly. Yeah. No, I know I need to do that. I just don't know how to do it. And sometimes you hit a weird wall with where it's like, the the problem is I do like it. I like how it sounds, and so replacing it is difficult. Um. But yeah, if I if I can crack that nut, then I can reincorporate it into my set. Yeah, bust that nut. Always, always be busting. A B B. Speaking of cracking things. I feel like that was the most open and shut dream we've ever done. <laughs> told <Yeah>. you. <laughs> I told her. And she was like, well, let's do your dream. And I was like, yeah, I'm happy to. I don't think there's a lot of meat on those bones. She was like, nah, nah, it'll be a juicy one. <laughs> I was like, open and Not shut. what I said. <laughs> and then she was the first one to be like, this is what this is about. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Um, but also, I had the razor blade uh, entry pulled up, and it, it just plays into what we've been saying but it's interesting uh to dream of a bare razor blade represents conflict in your life that requires you to be absolutely perfect feeling that perfect adherence is required facing a problem where there is no room for mistakes which yeah it makes sense that that is how parenthood feels yeah i mean thankfully i am perfect i'm worried about olivia but (laughs) i am perfect so we got that covered at least your sasquatch baby will know how to shave it does make sense i have like uh I have like bodily harm anxiety about baby stuff. That's like the uh-huh. main way that my anxiety is coming in. So it does make sense that the tail end there, I was like, but we got to be careful. We got to baby proof this. His giant or razor. get injured. <laughs> <laughs> His giant razor bolted to the wall. That's right. I just, I love that the baby is like this huge, hairy beast. <laughs> it's like. Not something you typically think of as like fragile. It's like out there chopping down trees with its <laughs> teeth and the like. And Victor's like, be careful. <laughs> be careful, my sweet little angel. <laughs> I, you like, know, Rawr. I do have, I have like the, oh, it's like a sweet little 
innocent, like vulnerable thing that we have to make sure doesn't die or get injured or whatever. But mostly it feels like a fucking hurricane coming to like sweep through our lives and right, leave right. nothing untouched. So yeah, it makes sense that it's a Sasquatch. Yeah. In just a few short years, it will be indestructible. <laughs> and you won't have to worry about the baby hurting itself. You have to worry about, I don't know, the baby hurting your stuff. I don't know. I don't know what it's like to have a kid. I don't know what the hurricane does when it comes <laughs> through. about the baby hurting you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Start locking your doors. If it's me or the baby, I think that baby's going to win. <laughs> yeah, no, this, this, dream made, this dream made me think of Harry and the Henderson. Oh, oh yeah. yeah that's... I've never seen that movie. We should watch that. I've heard it's good. I haven't seen it since I was a kid, but I remember loving it. I did listen to like a good um, Sasquatch uh, podcast, though. That's pretty fun. I think it's called like, oh man, let me try and find the name of it. I think it's like Big Feet or something like that. <laughs> and you, you were like incredulous when Olivia was like, you're a Bigfoot guy, right? He is a Bigfoot guy. <laughs> and you were like, what do you mean? <laughs> How many times on this podcast have you been like, can this be a cryptid podcast? When can this be a Bigfoot podcast? You are a Bigfoot guy. Today it is. But I Like Bigfoot's just an example of a cryptid, right? It is the most famous one. It's, Who doesn't like Bigfoot? It's like, the, like on some level. It's like the Michael Jordan of cryptids. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, no, I know. I think it's like the Helen Keller thing. It's like, you're not, you're not a fan of Helen Keller. It just comes up a lot. Oh, she just lives in my brain. Right. Yeah. Bigfoot is like connected to stuff for me. Part of the wiring in my brain is is Bigfoot. Yeah. I, I think I've been actively trying not to think about him or not actively, but like subtly avoiding thinking about Helen Keller since, you know, we did a unit in school about her. Yeah. <laughs> it just sounds terrifying. But maybe that's why you think about it all the time. It's just good perspective. Like I like. I'll be experiencing something and I'll be like, but what would this be like if I couldn't hear or see? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't even know how you would know is what's special about you. You know what I mean? Like when you just I don't think in, I would have ADHD if I couldn't hear or see. You just lived in silent darkness. How do you like figure out that or anything? <laughs> like, I don't understand how they got to the point where they were communicating with her. And I think this is the second time we've talked about Helen Keller on this podcast. We had a whole, we had a long conversation about Helen Keller on this podcast, early days, episode well, five. Should we get into the Roman Empire? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably like the, the version of hell that I find the most like terrifying. The Roman Empire? Yes. Uh, no, like the, like the idea of just like being kind of cast into darkness oh. <laughs> with nothing and no one, you know, to just kind of be like a consciousness without any input you know for eternity right like that's the that's the yeah. version that's always been scariest to me is just like total just your mind and nothing yeah on our road trip from denver to la uh, shelby and i were talking about um claustrophobia uh versus agoraphobia which you know i didn't look it up let me look up the definition of agoraphobia real quick make sure i'm not sounding like an idiot not, like afraid to leave the house Maybe agoraphobia is not what I meant. No, it's fear of house spiders. I, w <laughs> I was afraid, or I was, I was referring to like the opposite of claustrophobia, basically, the fear of open spaces. I think that's a different phobia, right? Oh, yeah. Fear of open spaces, not agoraphobia is the first Google. Kenophobia is an intense fear of empty spaces or voids. Um, but I, I was talking about how I understand that sometimes. Like I get glimpses. Like, I don't have it, but I get glimpses of, like, oh, this must be what they are feeling, people who, who feel this. Like, uh, crossing a crosswalk where there's, like, a lot of lanes, and when you, you're stepping out and there's nothing for you to put your hands on and you're just in the middle of where cars belong. You know what I mean? That's, that, like, gives me a little jolt of anxiety sometimes the same way, like, closed spaces do. Uh, and I think, I think if you're an anxious person, you have, like, a predisposition to have any kind of phobia but um i think more people can like tune into and understand and relate to claustrophobia because there's so many more like that's common to like cars elevators there's a lot of like instances where claus planes where like claustrophobia can show itself to you but uh in my example was like like everybody can visualize or has seen in movies 
or talked about the idea of being buried alive. That's like the ultimate claustrophobia. And the reverse example of this kinophobia or whatever would be like being cast into space, like in the movie Gravity. Mm. And so you don't think about that very often. But when, when, when people saw that movie, when Sandra Bullock goes flying backwards into space, that is like, oh, fuck, that would be absolutely terrifying. That would be hell. But you, you, there's no analog to that here on Earth. So you kind of have to have like imaginative anxiety to get there. I feel that way about um, deep water. Like, not so much like being on the surface, but like being underwater and it being like a vast, expansive, like nothingness. Yeah, I mean, that is that, kind of like space. That, but it's actually worse if I can like see things in the water, like big submerged things. I think there's a word for this too. Thalassophobia. Oh, okay. I might be saying it wrong, but it's spelled like that. Thalassophobia. It's a specific phobia that involves a persistent, intense fear of deep bodies of water, such as the ocean. I thought it had to do with big objects in the water. Yeah, I've heard that too, but I don't. I just, just didn't know what the word. Well, that's was. megalohydrothalassophobia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The fear. Of, that's stupid. The fear of underwater <laughs> creatures or objects. They're like a German word for the name of a phobia being so stupid it makes you less scared of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel about it now. <laughs> After hearing that. <laughs> Hydro megala Charizard phobia. That's fucking dumb. <laughs> I'm not scared anymore. To another dream i have one like full one and then i have like a short impactful one that's probably as easy as victor's to unpack yeah we could do that also side side note um i think the last dream of mine we did was like the snake dream and since then i've had two other snake dreams so i'm like having snake dreams right now which is interesting you're in your snake you era said, yeah said python stuff was coming up for you now the dream we did was a rattlesnake, but you said you were seeing pythons now. There was one dream. Yeah, there was actually no. It was yeah. It was two two pythons. Mm. I don't know if that was influenced because like I think I had these after we did my last one, and I had seen that you pulled up a python entry. I like remembered that, but um. It says here Python is a high level general purpose programming language. It's designed. <laughs> philosophy emphasizing code readability with the use of significant indentation so Great. make it that what you will yeah a coding joke for all you <laughs> nerds out there <laughs> uh, to dream of a python represents feelings about situations or relationships that constrict or squeeze you slowly um yeah 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 i think i read i read this entry earlier and I'm, I'm not i think we should i don't know if we want to if we have like time to get into all the snake content that I have, but I just thought I would <laughs> bring it content. up be because it's just, it's interesting that that sometimes that'll happen. There was like a period of time where I was having like persistent bear dreams and yeah, I don't know that that happens periodically. And so, yeah, you're right, Zach. I'm in my snake era right now. We'll have, we should have like an animal corner for Olivia or she can just talk about like the, the main animal she's seeing in her dreams and we can dig into that and, Next week we'll do pythons, and we'll have a live python on for all you listeners. Oh, I gotta go get a python now. <laughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> I was trying to make a python what? joke this whole time, oh. <laughs> and it turns out I was trying to make an anaconda joke. Oh, uh, well, let's hear it. I was just gonna say pythons also mean that uh, you don't want to, you don't want none if they don't got buns on. Ah, uh, but that's oh, that's yeah. an anaconda. I was trying to balance out the nerd joke with the with a yeah with a dumb joke that's nah, too bad <laughs> do you have any anaconda dreams <laughs> no <laughs> no anacondas yeah do we want to do your supposedly open and shut <laughs> sure yeah dream supposedly i mean it's really short i don't even remember if there's not a lot of context or, or story that i remember uh i just remember being at a cafe and then 
You okay? My butt's asleep. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> That'll happen. I'm listening. Just don't it's mind a, me. A cushion for floor sitting next time. I just, I need to let the blood return to my cheeks. <laughs> um. Yeah, I was at a cafe, like on a outdoor patio thing, and, and off in the distance, like on an, it looked like it was on an island, kind of. Or, or maybe it is. It was New York City. Is New York City on an island? Part of it is, right? Manhattan. Yeah, yeah Manhattan's an island. Um, and it was the New York City skyline, and it got nuked. And I was, you know, far enough away that I didn't feel like it was going to, I wasn't, I was going to be okay. Like, I wasn't going to be in the blast radius. But it was, like, several atomic bombs. And the, la- the last one, like, culminated in this, like, tower of fire. And it just, like, it was really detailed and really epic and really scary and really, like, I remember feeling very defeated. And it stood out to me because I've had, like, a couple of, I, I've had a couple of other, like, nuclear holocaust dreams in the past. Yeah. Um, but not in a long time. And they are all, they're always like that, where they're very visually impactful and memorable and, and, and like, detailed feeling. Um, I think anytime I dream of something like bit large scale, like a Godzilla sized monster or like an alien invasion, anything like that, it always sticks with me. And it's kind of cool in a way, like visually the way my brain can paint a picture like that. But in the moment it's, it was not fun. So, uh, I'm not sure what it was about, but it's just so, oh, okay. it's just so short that I feel like it's solvable. <laughs> so you just remember being like, were you in the city? No, I was across a big body of water from it. Okay, and you were looking out at the city, and then you saw yeah. a nuke fall onto the city. In a cafe. I was sitting in a cafe, yeah. Oh, okay. And there were several bombs. There were like three or four mushroom clouds. Gotcha. How did you feel? Scared? But do, you felt scared, but like safe where you were? Uh, safe from these blasts, yeah. But I also I remember turning to someone to like express fear or awe or whatever. Hmm. And all that, like, came out was, like, defeat. Like, I, I, what I expressed to this person was just, like, like, yeah, I'm done. We're done. It's over. Yeah. Do you want to just stalt the, uh, the nuclear bomb? <laughs> Get into the headspace of, of the nuke as it fell? If that is a character, it would be the most impactful one, yeah. But I don't know how to do that. I guess we did all symbolism on your dream, so we could take it. Yeah, let's. We could take a different route this time. Oh, I mean, I mean, if if you're interested in doing that, you're welcome. I I was kidding, but uh, yeah, oh. if you want to do that. <laughs> well, there's only one symbol, really. Maybe two, if you count cafe. Yeah, I've got New York nuclear oh, war, yeah. nuclear bomb, cafe, and defeat. Yeah, it was interesting that it was explicitly New York in my head because I have very little relationship with that city. Yeah. 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 Let's run through them. Um. So, to dream of New York represents social interaction with others. Or you notice that you are better than other people in some way. <laughs> Look, New of York. course, yeah, that's that what New York right. means. <laughs> that really feels correct. You may notice that you are richer, smarter, luckier, or more mature than other people. Oh, my God. <laughs> Negatively, New York City may reflect social interactions with other people that enjoys arrogantly talking down to others or talking to people like you are better than them. Arrogantly speaking to others with the assumption that you are better. Talking to others like you are too busy to deal with their problems or be patient with others. Arrogantly talking to others like you are a specialist. <laughs> Does that donk after do donk on New York. That... If we have any New York <laughs> listeners, these the Dream Bible was compiled through surveys, so Yeah. It's your fault. You can't argue with it. It's not it's how you are, it's how you make other people feel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm dreaming um, here. <laughs> All right, a nuclear war. To dream of a nuclear war represents feelings about conflict that risks total devastation of relationship. Conflict where both sides may risk totally wiping each other out completely. Feeling that you are fighting against a problem that risks all that you care about, risking everything you have to keep everything you have. A nuclear bomb. To dream of a nuclear bomb represents a event or life situation that devastates you or sacrifices or or sacrifices everything you thought or believed in, usually to negative thoughts or emotions. A nuclear bomb suggests a dramatic change of events, views, or feelings, often bringing feelings of a helplessness and loss of control over a situation. Something you thought was important may have ended. To dream of a nuclear bomb that hasn't gone off. Well, that wasn't this situation. No. Um. Yeah. Any thoughts on nukes? Yeah, what that brought up was, before we started recording, I was talking about some money stress. Mm. 
And, uh, you know, cause we just moved Shelby out here and she's actively job hunting, but you know, it's tight right now. Um, and we're both a little freaked out. So, I mean, that's, that's what it brought up for me is uh, there's something in there about like financial ruin. Not that like, I feel like I'm actually on the precipice of that, but the, you know, if I were to exaggerate my stress to like, did it say financial ruin? So it gave that as an example, I think. In like the first paragraph, maybe. Uh, it devastates your sacrifices, everything you thought you believed in. There are some examples of like death of a family member, being fired from a job, a huge embarrassment, breaking up with someone, or big disappointment. Yeah, that's why none of it yeah. like totally resonates, 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 because it's like, I don't know, it's just, it's all like pragmatic stress on the way to like something we're excited about. Yeah, the the New York connection, because those are the two big symbols, right? Is like the New York thing is like something social, um, which maybe is like, you know, a relationship is very social, right? And so like th- this is people stuff you're dealing with, like that you, you guys are now living together or whatever. But I it honestly made me think more about like social anxiety when I was listening to it. But that may not be real reflective of where you're at like right now you know yeah to dream of a cafe reflects your mindset feeling good while you wait for something to happen okay so that could be like that tracks more than anything so far it may also reflect enjoyment talking about something you really like that's being taken care of for you you may be happy to be patient for something feeling good knowing that what you want is about to happen positive social interactions while being catered to and um defeat To dream of defeat represents a sense of loss or disappointment, feeling beaten, difficulty accepting something that you don't like, suffering under terrible conditions, feeling like a failure or that you couldn't meet higher (coughs) standards, feeling about to accept that a relationship is over, feeling overcome that you can't put up with something or that a challenge was too much for you. It's just describing defeat. Yeah. (laughs) I'm trying to think outside the box here because... Obviously, the big thing in my life happening is having moved Shelby here and and all the next steps we're very focused on in terms of moving out of my current apartment and into a new one, getting her job situation stabilized, yada, yada. That's everything big going on, but I don't know how to apply it. The cafe stuff made sense. Yeah, I mean, if the cat, I mean, it it makes sense to me. Like the New York stuff is like, maybe New York is like, you know, it's social, right? So maybe it's like being in the city and all dealing with the work and the people and blah, blah, blah. It's like life, right? Life. Um, and then the cafe is like, right now you are like, things are good. You're waiting for something to happen that you don't really have any control over, which is mm-hmm. Shelby finding a, a, another job. That it kind of seems like in this dream, the anxiety the thing that you're waiting for in this dream is the nuclear bombs though. Right. Like, and that could reflect like anxiety that you have about the ways in which like, you know, the, the, even if it's like pragmatic stuff, you know, just like the things that you're concerned about not going the way that you want them to right now, or that could cause you guys stress in this time. You're kind of in a time of uncertainty right now. But, like, isn't that the cafe entry is about, like, waiting for something and enjoy... Is it about enjoying waiting for something? Yeah, feeling good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, like, enjoying and taking enjoyment while you wait for something that's being taken care of for you. Okay, I see. Being happy to patiently wait for something. Um, Yeah, which this is kind of out of your hands. You're already doing everything you can be doing, right? Which is scary when it feels like, like you know, everything could blow up or whatever because it sounds like you're under a lot of stress, right? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a really that's a really tough position to be in. That would drive me crazy to feel like, well, the stakes are really high. What can I do? Kind of nothing, you know? That, that's not a good place to be. And at the same time, you're, like, in a good place because, you know, you were, what you were looking forward to was having Shelby there, and that is... It's happening. Happened, you know? So now you're in a place where you're, like, you're in a good place, and you're waiting, (laughs) and there's anxiety. Yeah, you know? Yeah. That dream does kind of seem like a reflection of, like, just the anxiety of being in that place of, like, of waiting, even though you're in, like, you're now, like, with your person, and you get to enjoy that. Yeah, like, everything you guys have been 
talking about and preparing for leading up to this is happening right so all the good stuff is happening but then also all the stuff you're worried about is like you know kind of closer than it's ever been so it's like yeah has to get sorted i'm wondering if maybe the you know the severity of the atomic bomb and the implications of what new york means symbolically could have to do with like a fear now that this is happening but like a fear of this transition because i've been single for like a minute now like a few years and so it's like yeah it's a big transition to go from that to this is my person and we're going to move in together it's a big lifestyle change and money's a stressor and for a while now i've been able to just like get by on like 30 dollars worth of grocery money a week eating the same meal every night like just like really living bare bones in order to pursue you know creative career stuff and now i'm looking at like real adult responsibilities that come along with having a a serious partner and maybe there's a part of me that's worried that like if new york represents like this highfalutin sort of like big economy you know where it all happens sort of like mm-hmm. attitude and i'm seeing that get blown up maybe that's what i'm worried about is that like i'm going to have to fucking fall back on a plan b or something to pay the bills and give up on my dreams or whatever i'm not saying that that's a thing especially not an imminent thing but it could be a fear now that I'm, we're hashing this out yeah and uh, like that that's a fear is a valid fear right but um i think you know there's no reason to jump to that you know there's a lot of good that can come from like kind of staying on the path you're on right oh no realistically having a teammate in life opens up more doors than it closes sure yeah but if i'm breaking you know breaking down this dream and like thinking about its constituent parts individually that might be a subconscious fear that i've lived with even before i started talking to shelby again might have been part of the yeah. reason i was single <laughs> i might have thought that like i had to be you know yeah yeah and like um digging into the new york thing like like you're like you're saying like um you know feeling like you have to like operate on like a real budget and like you're trying hard to break into something and you can't quite break into it or whatever is like you know it 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 can feel like there's this world that is like excluding you or like looking down on you in some way when it's really just doing its own thing you know but like uh because you haven't like broken into it yet it feels like you know it's a like a value judgment upon you or whatever right so it's like the podcasting thing or like the artistic stuff it's like you have the skill set you know you have the skill set you know that you can do work at a level or better than people that are doing it professionally but because you haven't cracked it it feels like oh i'm not good enough or they don't think i'm good enough or whatever you know it can feel that way until you like until you've found your way in you know yeah Alternatively, it could even be like a, a less of a fear simulation, more of a fantasy simulation. There might be part of me, if I'm being with, honest with myself, that wanted to blow up New York in my dream, metaphorically. Because <laughs> I, do, I do find myself, like, when I get frustrated about making, you know, headway in these realms, I, I, I find myself fantasizing about pulling a J.D. Solinger and just, like, moving to the countryside and making music just for fun and, like, working as a carpenter or whatever some trade just to anonymously get by and just just it fucking enjoy life and not worry about any kind of like that's a fantasy that i have sometimes you know um so that could be what that what the bomb was too on some level yeah some kind of rejection of of these like pressures that i put myself under yeah i feel i feel like i have that same kind of thing where it's like i i have my my mind set on something and to do anything else kind of feels like a failure, but then, like, sometimes your fallback plans actually sound like success, you know? Like, like what you just described sounds kind of great, right? Mm-hmm. It's, like, stable job and doing the artistic stuff you love doing, and, like, there's, no, there's nothing about that that's worse than what you're trying to do or what you're doing, you know? But it still feels like, because you're changing course or changing what your priorities are or whatever, it feels like a failure or a giving up in some way, even though it's just fully a different path there could be like some sunk cost fallacy at play with that kind of thing right yeah like if you're real invested into carpentry up till now 
And then you're like, fuck this. I'm going to go into podcasting. That's where, <laughs> that's where the money is. <laughs> yeah. No, there, yeah, there is when I like indulge the, like the plan B fantasies. A lot of the times it is like, like the idea of like moving to like a small market and getting like, you know, trade certified to do something that's high paying. And then you start thinking about like, well, with that much money in a place like South Carolina, like I could have enough land to have goats. <laughs> and like the fantasy starts getting like, oh shit, this is kind of cool actually. <laughs> like may, yeah. maybe, you know, maybe the shit that was important to me in my early 20s isn't that important. And yeah, it has just become on some level a sunken cost thing, like you said, Olivia. Well, what what is it about like the path that you're on? Like what's the end game of, of like what you're doing? Like where are you trying to get to? Uh, just to make enough money to live doing something that like doesn't feel like work where like mm. all my main goal is just to enjoy my days right i don't want to go to work and like be like waiting to get home sit like counting minutes on the clock just like dreading work like i just yeah it doesn't feel like how life is supposed to go like we only get so much time it feels like a real bunch of bullshit <laughs> to, to not enjoy eight hours of every day um, For sure. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not trying to necessarily make a big splash or or be well regarded in any. So that used to be my goal as a younger person was to not even be famous, but just well regarded within a community, um, for my talents or whatever. And these days, it's more like I just want to like enjoy being alive 100 percent of the time. Well, no one does that. <laughs> well, you can get pretty close. Yeah, excluding like migraines and diarrhea. Maybe ninety eight percent of the time, I want to enjoy being alive, minus the ailments that come with having a body. Yeah, no, I mean that to me sounds like your priorities are are is like right in the right place, you know, because mm -hmm. that is that's not like oh I want to do this for like you know external validation or whatever. You're just trying to enjoy your life, you know. Yeah, external validation would be cool, but also I just know that I love audio and podcasts and recording and when I'm doing it I don't feel like I'm working so that would be a great thing to do for a living and I have no other marketable skill set feeling down there on the floor Olivia physically or overall in general <laughs> uh yeah you know you're surviving my body is not my own yeah no here's a vessel for a sasquatch <laughs> by the way I really thought this would be a funny bit but no one's called me out on it I have two of the exact same beverage here but one's big and one's little Oh, <laughs> I did that's not too notice. subtle for us. I've been all I've been alternating, and I, I was I was going to gaslight you guys. And <laughs> as soon as somebody said something, I'd be like, "No, it's just I just have one." Yeah, and then you bring out the big one the next time. Yeah, I've been doing this fun bit with with Shelby where I blame my farts on her, and I call it gaslighting. That's what makes a relationship strong. Mm -hmm. That kind of shit. Fart bits, yeah. Chicks <laughs> love them. They do. You know, some people are fart like include farts in their relationship, and some people don't. Uh huh. Yeah. Where do Where do you guys fall? We don't. We're not fart people. We're not really. Yeah. We're not like fart in front of each other, people. But like, we deal with farts. Like, there's a lot we of. We still fart. <laughs> yeah, we fart. The dogs fart. Everybody Everyone farts. farts. Yeah, y'all have bodies. Yeah, that's no. But like, you know, you know, keep that a secret. We're not, like, ripping ass in front of each other, though. Yeah, I'm never, like, trying to make it Olivia's problem, you know? If I, could, if I can step out of the room, I will. <laughs> yeah, that's why I turn it into a bit. I'm trying to, instead of making it her problem, I try to make it her entertainment. That's uh, the thing, is, like, when you're working with a small space, there's only so much you can do. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Yeah, I mean, you gotta, if it's, the smelly ones are never funny. <laughs> they have to be noise based bits 
Yeah, but you how do you know if it's going to be smelly or not? Well, you you go to the other room for the first couple. <laughs> Check them out. Do some test or some test runs. Uh we haven't mentioned this on the podcast, but Victor's album came out. Oh yeah, my album came out a little while ago. We should tell people where they can find your album. I released an album called Tame. It's on Spotify and Bandcamp. The band name is Deesser, which is D E dash E S S E R. Um look for a girl in a dress with a bear head. The recent album, the album art is a jackalope that Olivia illustrated. Oh, that was you? And, nice. Uh, yeah, she's good. She's pretty good. She's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's tame. Um, and D-E-S-E-R. D-E-S-S-E-R. It's good. You have a very pretty voice. That's sweet. So pretty. And Olivia did a fair number of harmonies on it. Um, so if you want to hear Olivia singing then listen to some of the songs on the album. They've heard all of us sing if they've listened to this podcast. Mm -hmm. That's That's true. I don't know if they know that. (laughs) Yeah, the two of you on the intro and me on the outro. Yeah. Yep. Did you mix it totally solo bolo, or did you let Olivia hear her harmonies in the mix before the final Um, product? There there was like some rustling where like I would do my mix and then she would be like, No, I don't want it to sound like that. Let me re let me try it again. Let me t- do blah blah blah. And then I would like wrestle it away from her and be like, No, leave it alone. We're 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 doing this. <laughs> um and land it on something ultimately that worked. I hope for both of us, but <laughs> it's fine. I I... Usually he wanted to make me louder than I wanted. That's what I was gonna guess yeah that was the that was the fight and we fought like hell yeah almost ended our marriage mm-hmm. but we're here today make it all worth it just and go listen to Tame. barely <laughs> barely holding on <laughs> thank you for listening to the young and the restless you can follow us on social media at the young and the restless pod and submit your dreams for interpretation to the young and the restless pod at gmail and as we always say, don't, don't sass the squash. Did you a tiger lily on the floor?